Chapter Four of the Outdoor Chums in the Big Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Outdoor Chums in the Big Woods by Captain Quincy Allen. Chapter Four. Headed for the Big Woods. On the second day after leaving home, the four chums found themselves upon what Bluff called the last leg of their railroad trip. They were already in the state of Maine and heading north, bound for the station where they expected to get off, and somehow find their way to the place where Mr. Samuel Darrell, the well-known lumberman, was to be found, according to his letter to Uncle Felix. This was a logging camp known as Lumber Run. It lay in the depths of the big woods, and was surrounded by a virgin growth of fine timber that would consume some years in the cutting. No doubt the crews were already starting in to work, and the boys anticipated considerable enjoyment in seeing how the loggers dropped their trees. Of course, the most picturesque part of the business came in the spring, when, after the customary freshets, the logs were rafted down the river to the accompaniment of thrilling exploits by the lumberjacks. The train was filled with people, every seat having been taken in the day coaches at the time the four boys got aboard. As a consequence, although they did not much fancy it, they were compelled to sit in the smoking car. At times they opened the windows a bit so as to get some fresh air. Of course there was a motley assortment of rough-looking men aboard, some of them having been honest tillers of the soil returning home after a visit down in Boston or Portland. Others were undoubtedly lumbermen, heading for the regions farther north, where they anticipated doing a season's chopping, for as a rule they carried their axes with them. There were sportsmen on the train, too, and naturally these claimed more than a share of attention from Frank and the other boys. Anything that had to do with hunting interested them. They listened whenever they heard some of these men discussing the chances for making a record bag that season. "'Sounds from the way they talk,' remarked Bluff at one time, "'as though there never was so much game in the woods as this year.' "'I only hope it turns out that way,' Jerry went on, "'because we'd be nearly tickled to death if we bagged a big moose "'after all our past hunts. "'That's one thing I've dreamed of doing many a time.' "'As for me,' ventured Will, with a long sigh, "'I'd rather be able to get a picture of the moose "'than plant a bullet back of his shoulder.' I think I'll let the rest of you supply the game for the pot while I spend all my time trying for something that will give us pleasure later on, whenever we look at it. Everyone to his taste, said Bluff. I admit that I wouldn't give a snap of my finger for crawling around in the night, trying to take pictures of silly little coons and foxes that may have been baited to come up and pull a string. When I hunt, I want to see something worth while drop. "'Like that grizzly bear we ran across when we were out west?' suggested Jerry, his eye kindling with vivid recollections. "'I was thinking,' remarked Frank, "'how some of these city sportsmen aboard here, togged out in the latest clothes, "'and seeming as though they'd stepped out of bandboxes, "'keep looking over at us every once in a while, "'just as if they wondered how a pack of boys had been able to break away from the apron strings of their mothers.' "'If we up and told them one half of what we've been through,' suggested Bluff, "'I reckon they'd either think us descended from old Baron Munchausen, "'who could tell the biggest whoppers ever heard, "'or else they'd believe we'd broken loose from some lunatic asylum.' "'Watch that hard-looking fellow the other two called Bill Nackerson,' "'remarked Will in a low tone. "'He's forever taking a nip out of that flask he carries, "'and then offering it to each of his bunch. "'Both his mates accept, but that big boy I've seen shake his head.' He doesn't seem to like the stuff. Well, Frank observed, can you blame him when he sees such a horrible example in his uncle? For that seems to be the relation he bears to the big hunter. There, look the other way. He's scowling at us as if he might have guessed we were talking about him. Pretend we're admiring the scenery in this patch of woods where the snow hangs on the pines and hemlocks and firs. It's pretty enough to admire, you'll all admit. Think of the nerve of that Nackerson fetching his old partridge dog in here when all the other dogs are chained in the baggage car, observed Jerry. Well, the brakeman wanted to throw the dog out, but when he saw that he would be sure to start a row, he gave it up and went off growling, said Will. 
Yes, but I saw one of the other hunters slip something into his hand that looked like a bank bill, Frank told them. They've all got plenty of money, that's sure, and such men always believe they can buy whatever they want. He's still looking over this way from time to time. I hope he doesn't take a notion to make trouble for us, mentioned Will, who was the most peace-loving of the chums. He's been taking more than he ought to, and is hardly responsible for his actions. I'd hate to get into a quarrel with such a fellow. All the same, muttered Bluff, a dozen like him couldn't make me knuckle down if I knew I was in the right. Shh! Not another word. He's coming over here, hissed Frank. All of them felt their hearts beating faster than usual, as the big sportsman advanced along the aisle, his eyes fastened on them. "'Does that heavy bag that fell on my dog belong to any one of you kids?' he asked thickly in a threatening voice. Sometime before, a little accident had happened. The dog, in prowling around as far as his tether would admit, had managed to knock over a pack, and that it caused him a certain amount of pain his yelps had testified. At the time the owner had been in another car, but seeing the dog licking his hurts, he must have forced one of his companions to tell him what had happened. Frank hastened to explain, not in an apologetic way, but simply telling the facts, that it was really the animal's fault he had upset the pack on himself. It was the only place the thing could be set, and the brakeman himself put it there, he declared. The dog was nosing around and got his rope caught in the bag, so that he pulled it over on his back. I fixed it so the accident can't possibly happen again, sir. The man was in a very ugly mood. He looked Frank over with a dangerous scowl, but so far as he could be seen, the boy did not quail. Then Nackerson began to berate him for having such an unwieldy pack, and leaving it at an end of the car he wanted for the use of his prized dog. What do you mean, setting a trap like that? he demanded. I believe you did it just to see how you could catch my dog. That sort of thing belongs in the baggage car, and it's time you took it there, do you hear me? I hear you all right, replied Frank, pale, perhaps, and yet meeting the ugly look of the other steadily. But you must understand that we have a perfect right to carry any hand baggage in the car with us. If your dog had been where he belonged, in that same baggage car, possibly he wouldn't have been hurt. And it doesn't amount to much, I figure, sir. His bold words infuriated the hunter. But for his two friends, who seized hold of his arms, he might have attacked Frank, and then, as Bluff said afterward, there would have been the Dickens to pay. The other hunters must have realized that their companion was in the wrong. They saw that others in the car would have jumped to the assistance of the boys, had a struggle been precipitated. Accordingly, they soothed him as best they could, and in one way or another managed to coax the big brute back to his seat. There he sat, every once in a while twisting his head around to scowl toward Frank and his chums, while muttering dire threats under his breath. Twice he even started to get to his feet, whereupon Bluff Masters doubled up his fists aggressively, and clenched his teeth hard, as though ready for the battle that seemed imminent. On both occasions, however, the other men succeeded in pulling Nackerson back into his seat before he could break loose so all the rest of the journey was pursued with what might be called an armed truce prevailing. "'I'm feeling sorry for that big boy they call Teddy,' remarked Frank later on, when they had reason to believe that another half-hour would take them to the station where they expected to get out. "'Me too,' added Bluff. "'He seems to be made of different stuff from his ugly relative.' "'He certainly looks disgusted with the way his uncle acts,' Will declared. How do you suppose he came to be with them up here, Frank? Oh, I suppose they asked him to come along and help out with the cooking, replied the other, and he caught at the chance to get an outing without any expense. Some men come up here just to drink and lie around camp. They are ashamed to carry on that way at home, and too lazy to even bother cooking, so they either have guides to do all the work or else fetch some half-grown boy along. I'm sorry for Teddy, because I imagine he's in for a bad time all round, and with mighty little pleasure. Already the boy is more than half afraid of his uncle, Will gave as his opinion. Like as not, he never dreamed he would turn out to be such a brute once he got started for the woods. I hope they keep the man quiet until we can leave the train, said Frank. It would be unpleasant to have a row to begin with. Didn't you say ours was the next one to this stop? asked Bluff eagerly, as he pressed his nose against the glass and looked out, when the train came to a stop at a small country station. 
Yes, it's the next, Frank observed, though if we chose we could go on to Clayton, and even then be about as close to Lumber Run. I was told we might find the trail a little better from Burnt Pine, and that's why I picked it out. Looks pretty lonely, doesn't it? asked Will. Just what I expected to find, Frank replied. I've always known that in all Maine this section had gone free the longest from the operation of the loggers. That's why it's called the Big Woods. For many years it's been a favorite place for guides to bring parties of sportsmen, because they were pretty sure to find deer, moose, perhaps a bear, and always an abundance of partridge. But, remarked Bluff, now that Samuel Darrell and his company, in which Uncle Felix has a big interest, have bought up all this section, with the idea of getting out the timber, it'll only be a few years before the game is thinned out. Logging always hurts hunting. End of chapter 4